We're good to go now? All right. So welcome to Isbin Pa's 2018 webinar series. The International Society of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity stands as the leading global voice in the behavioral nutrition and physical activity science. I am Siona Fernandez, and it is my pleasure not only to host today's webinar, but to be joined by two highly regarded experts in the field. A bit of housekeeping before we commence. The webinar strongly encourages open dialogue and inquiry with our experts for which we have allocated 20 minutes. We're using the Zoom platform today and all participants are muted by default. To partake in discussion, we suggest that you write your questions in the Q&A box as soon as you have them, or you could use the raise your hand function during the discussion to interact verbally with the panelists. Feel free to ask questions along the way, but remember that we will ask them only after the presentations. I will summarize the comments at the end of the talks and ask questions on the audience's behalf. The full screen mode is available to you, if not already, for your convenience of enjoying the webinar. Research students often report feeling overwhelmed during their PhD, finding it difficult to meet expectations and an increasing and stressful workload, which over time may lead to PhD students experiencing burnout. There is also the difficulty of managing their professional journey with one's personal hobbies, daily tasks, family, and social life. We have invited to experienced speakers to share their insights and tips on the PhD journey and preventing burnout. I would like to welcome Professor Jim Salas from the University of California, San Diego, and Professor Erica Hinkson from the Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. Professor Erica will lead with her presentation for the first 20 minutes followed by Professor Jim Salas. Thereafter, we have approximately 20 minutes for you to ask questions and have a general discussion on the topic. Professor Erica Hinkson is the co-director of the Center for Child Health Research and Senior Researcher at the Human Potential Center at Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. She is the head of School of Sport and Recreation she has been involved in large national, regional, and international projects such as IPEN, Adolescent Project, TravelWise, Urban, and Bean Studies. She's on the steering committee for IPEN and founding member of the Citizen Science Global Network and Citizen Science Leadership Task Force. Professor Erica, we are so honored to have you today. The time is now yours. Uh, thank you, Siona. Can you see my screen all right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Siona. Thank you for the introduction and also organizing the webinar on behalf of NESI. Um, today, I will be sharing some uh, principles and strategies about how to manage your uh, study without burning out. Uh, primarily focusing on doctoral studies, PhD degree. Uh, these principles and strategies are a compilation um, over the years uh, from my experiences as a result of the different roles that I have been involved in. Uh, prior to becoming the head of School of Sport and Recreation at Auckland University of Technology, I was the Associate Dean Postgraduate Research for the Faculty of Health and environmental sciences at AUT for approximately six years. During that time, I was um, 
uh, faced with uh, with uh, student issues, uh, uh, simply uh, the students would come to me uh, if they had issues that were uh, not able to resolve at the lower level. So I was dealing with some complex issues um, during that time. So I have a lot of experiences, uh, you know, from that time in that role. I was also a super, uh, I am currently and have uh, supervised to completion 10 uh, doctoral students, uh, successful completion. And currently I am supervising about eight uh, PhD students. Also, I bring experiences from uh, my personal experiences as a student, a PhD student many years ago. So today think of these strategies as a toolbox uh, with uh, different tools to be used when needed. Uh, you may not need them all, uh, you may need some, or some of them might not be relevant to you or you, uh, you, you would perhaps not agree with uh, the, some of the things that I'm talking about today. That's fine, whatever it is, take uh, what you need from this presentation. So let's begin. Okay, so the journey, let's look at the journey first and the milestone. When you undertake a doctoral study, your PhD study, uh, there are several different um, stages. Of your, obviously you have to be admitted to the program and enroll. You might be asked to uh, support progress reports. Uh, a huge milestone is the confirmation of candidature. Uh, you also need to uh, deal with ethical um, ethics applications and responding to the ethics committee frequent meetings with your supervisors, data collection, data analysis, chapter write-up, submission for examination. Again, that is another big milestone. For most universities, they also ask for oral examination and oral defense of the PhD, another big milestone. And from that revision, submission and graduation, another big milestone. And along the way, uh, uh, completing manuscripts or towards the end. So that's the journey. We plan for the journey and usually we have in our proposals, we have a timeline with a plan of how things will progress. But at the, bo the bottom figure there, that's actually the reality. Uh, even though we have a nice program as we've discussed with our supervisors, at the end of the day, the, the journey um, is, uh, is, is, represent, is better represented in the you know, uh, bottom figure right there. Uh, there will be highlights and low lights. There might be slow progress or fast progress. There might be challenges and successes. So at the end of the day, what I want you to take from this today is that uh, the, the journey will not be um, straight sailing. There will be challenges. But uh, the difference here is that we need to have strategies and tools to be able to meet those challenges and um, survive our PhD without burning out. In one of my uh, trips, uh, uh, this is a, a banner in one of the um, airports in New Zealand uh, that said in a culture of possibility, success never looks like a straight line. Uh, so it's so I thought it was very relevant for our webinar today. Um, and it, it is something that people understand out there. You know, don't expect to be a straight line. Uh, there will always be challenges, but how do we meet those challenges? So the first thing I would like you to think about is your why. Why are you involved with this PhD? What is it that drives you for this PhD? So you need to figure out what that why is. There is a very nice presentation by Simon Sinek. Uh, it is on YouTube. Um, he's an expert in, in leadership and also personal leadership and explains uh, very nicely how to create that why you know, that driver to help you get through some difficult times. Now, why do we need to have a why? There are many external factors that could influence our progress and also internal factors. For example, um, let's say you've designed a wonderful study, you're ready to start data collection, but none of the participants show up. Well, that's kind of a disaster, but, but we need to have the tools to be able to uh, meet those challenges. Uh, by the way, these are real examples from students that I have seen in the past. Um, another example is samples have been accidentally thrown out. Uh, again, who throws out samples, but, but that has happened in the past. Um, it takes a long time for committee to make a decision. 
And again, it could be the confirmation of candidature committee, the ethics uh, committee or whatever it is. And, um, you know, sometimes there is frustration, there is impatience, etc. cetera. Um, another example, again, this has happened, believe it or not, many times where the laptop has malfunctioned and there has been a loss of data. Or another example, more recently, uh, a student has gone overseas to collect data, put all the data on an external hard drive and uh, the backpack with the external hard drive were stolen and the lab data uh, uh, was lost. There could be also internal factors like a motivation, personal leadership, organization, managing external inputs. So in times like this, it's very important to have a why. So today I would like to cover um, a set my seven principles that I think are important to uh, work through to manage your study without burning out. So uh, I will go through these principles and provide some examples. Uh, I will talk about focus, that's one of them, urgency, initiative, competence, communication, interdependence, and finish with resilience. So let's start with the first principle, which is focus. Uh, and I want you to kind of ask the sixth question of yourselves when it comes to that. What is your why? As we said earlier, it's very important to have a why. You have that driver to help you through difficult times. Uh, an unclouded vision of what is ahead. What are your priorities? Your family, your study, your health, whatever it is. Uh, you need to identify what those priorities are and focus on the priorities. You need to make time for all those things. How effective then are you in the things that you do? Effectiveness is in direct proportion to the focus once apply, one applies. How adaptable are you? I think that's really important to be able to adapt readily to varied demands, novel situations and crisis. Are you able to identify the things that matter? How well are you spending your time on things that matter? Ask yourselves those questions. And those, the answer to those questions will help you with that focus. So the first activity I would like you to do, not necessarily at this time, after this presentation, is to think about your why. What is it? And watch that uh, YouTube video from Simon Sinek to help you with that activity. The second principle is urgency. I'm not talking about running around doing things without thinking, not the haze, but purposeful action. Deliberate, thoughtful, diligent, but timely. Uh, a sense of urgency, it shows intelligence, it's knowing the purpose of what you're trying to accomplish. You are able to accomplish more uh, and things that matter. So for example, when a, your supervisor is giving you a task, don't procrastinate with it. Ask yourself, what, stopped me, what is stopping me from doing this right now? Can I do this right now? Why not do this right now? That's that urgency. The third principle, it's about initiative, you know, showing that proactiveness, that initiative, willing to work through obstacles with tenacious and persistent effort coming up with a solution. I think that's a very important principle to have as a PhD student. Also, you need to have clarity. Be clear what is expected of you. And if you're not clear, ask. Because if you're clear, you'll be able to do more things what you need to do. And also be useful to your supervisors. Act on your knowledge and experience. You know, do the extra mile. You know, read the, the readings that you're asked to. Or go beyond the readings, perhaps. Or bring more, more new information to the team. Take it, do that extra mile. Your initiative is therefore in direct proportion of your ambition. The difference between insignificant and exceptional achievement is a matter of enthusiasm and determination. So it's important to show that initiative and that proactiveness. The fourth issue, another very important, sorry, a, a principle and a very important principle is competence. You need to be competent in your study, in the things that you do. Uh, knowledge applied, gaining experience. So in other words, to gain competence, you have to do, you have to spend time with it, whether it's a, a particular questionnaire 
or it's the, the data collected you know, from several participants, or whether there is a piece of equipment that you need to uh, work with. You gotta spend time with it. You, know, you have to understand it, know it, and that's how you gain that competence. But not only uh, through the things that you do yourself, but broadening knowledge and experience through others. So talk to the other students, um, attend their presentations, have student group discussion, find out how and what others have done, go to workshops. You know, often uh, PhD students say that they're isolated, even though they're in a room of, of, of other students, they're doing their own work. It's very important to get together, create these groups and share experiences and knowledge with one another and help with one another. Uh, be able to use technology and tools competently. Spend time with the use of equipment, try different things, test the machines. Again, you know, spend the time, go in on the weekends, do what's needed so you can understand and have that knowledge. And of course, we, uh, uh, we know that power comes from knowing your work. Another very important principle, and, and, I, and, I, and from my experience, I think it's most, one of the most important principles, it's communication. It is the single most important thing to resolve a crisis or prevent a crisis from happening. Often in the past, when I've dealt with you know, issues with, uh, with uh, supervisions or with students and supervisors or students uh, dealing with certain issues, uh, it, it came down to, uh, communication or lack of it. Uh, so for example, if there is inactivity from either the, the student or the supervisor, and there's no communication about it or not meeting the deadlines, often, you know, uh, the, the challenges arise. Be able to tolerate differences and respectfully communicate your view with your, uh, with, with where Whoever you are communicating with, particularly with your supervisor. If your supervisor comes with a particular feedback that you don't agree, don't stay silent and, 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 and not respond to the feedback. Uh, it is important to uh, let your supervisor know that perhaps you disagree with this particular feedback and these are the reasons why. It's very important to have that communication. And let me tell you, you know, the supervisors will appreciate this. What is uh, not spoken is often more important than what is said. And I put that there because sometimes, you know, students may withdraw and not necessarily communicate with, your, with their supervisors about the things that are thinking. And so it's important to, the, to, to understand that and also uh, make the decision that it's important to communicate with my supervisor if I'm not um, agreeing with what they're saying. Another important communication sort of uh, uh, advice here is don't judge body language, tone of voice, facial expressions and gestures because uh, different cultures have different ideologies. They, they you know, interpret things differently. So it's important to ask uh, or, uh, or, or, or uh, explain if it's you that, 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 that done a particular gesture. The reason I'm saying this is because uh, perhaps the supervisor may have gestured in some way or expressed themselves in some way that, you know, the student from a different culture is not a, it has taken it the wrong way. And instead of festering and um, not necessarily uh, dealing with that, uh, it is very important to go to your supervisor and, and say, hey, when you did this, this is how I felt. Is this what you meant? So important to, to communicate that. Listening is very important, of course. Uh, we're here to learn. As PhD students, we're here to learn. So listening is very important. And also when it comes to challenges and issues uh, faced, it is important to think about the relationship. Our supervisors, it would be our colleagues once we're finished. So it's very important to think about that relationship as well when we're dealing with challenges. Um, another very important principle is interdependence. Uh, in times of crisis or issue, help your fellow student. I talked about earlier about you know, students being isolated and not necessarily interacting with one another. It's very important to do. It's very important to interact, to be in groups, 
uh, to help one another. Uh, knowledge is power, power uh, but it's also uh, this knowledge should be shared, learning together, solving problems together. That's very important. We'll be able to do more if we're able to solve problems together. Uh, follow the policies and, and policies and procedures of the university. Be the example to other students. Help one another. Usually, um, uh, in terms of student responsibilities and what's expected of you, it's uh, written down in university handbooks. So go to those handbooks, have, have, have a look. Ask for help, very wise, and also be known for your reliability, de dependability, trustworthiness, and supportiveness. Help one another. The last principle that I would like to cover uh, today is resilience. Uh, it's important to be resilient, uh, forgive and forget. Uh, if something does not work, seek another solution. Don't panic, don't despair. It's very important that you do not panic. There is always a solution to every challenge, to every problem. It's whether we are uh, prepared to seek a solution. And also in times of crisis, identify a person you trust and confide in them. Have that buddy, that someone that you can share uh, things with. It's very important to go through this journey with others, not alone. If you make a mistake, if something happened and you've made a mistake, don't run away. You know, don't try to cover it. Be upfront, come up with a solution. Talk with your supervisor, uh, explain what's happened and come up with a solution. There's always a solution to every problem. And also trust in your ability. Uh, be your own cheerleader, that's very important. Uh, sometimes we're our number one enemy. And so it's very important to, under, to, to encourage your own self to be able to do the things that you want to do. And it's very important that you um, uh, uh, celebrate every milestone. Okay. So what's stopping us from following these seven principles? David Kekic, uh, Kekic who is a, an expert in longevity, um, has said that anxiety is caused by a lack of control organization and action. So what I would like to do in the next few minutes is to um, share with you some strategies around reducing that anxiety so we can follow those seven principles. Okay, um, here they are. Too many distractions. Uh, ineffective personal organizational skills, no planning, mind occupied with stuff instead of being creative, cluttered mind, uh, no time to really think, not being present. So as an activity, not necessarily right now, because I'm going to very shortly pass on this presentation to uh, Professor Jim Salas. Uh, think about what bugs you, what distracts you or consumes you the most in your life studies right now uh, and describe in a single sentence, what would you need to happen for you for, you, for this to be resolved? You know, what would be the thing that needs to happen that, uh, for this to be resolved? Write it down and write down the next action that you need to take and then see how that felt. Uh, did you feel enhanced control, relaxation, fault? Okay, go through that exercise and see how that feels. So when it comes to getting control of your student life, I've based this uh, on, on a book called Getting Things Done by David Allen. Uh, and he talks about capturing, uh, capturing things that happen in our lives, processing them, organizing them, then reviewing, having that big picture and also doing. So very briefly, I'm just gonna cover these. So when we talk about capturing, it's around, and something that I've used as well in, in my professional life and through my PhD, is investing time to capture what is incomplete. Everything, whether it's important or not important. 
things from emails, meetings, supervisors, the opportunities, reading articles, et cetera, et cetera. The reason for this is that once you've captured it, your mind would not be cluttered with all these low level things. You know, it will be captured somewhere and then you can do something about that information. So uh, in terms of process, let me give you an example. Let's talk about email. Let's say you receive a lot of emails. What are you gonna do with this? You know, so let's say you have a particular email. Here's a process. And it could be with other things as well, but right now I'm just gonna use <clears throat> the email as an example. So what is this thing that has arrived in my inbox? Is it actionable? If the answer is no, okay, where does it go? It can go to trash, uh, maybe someday folder, or you keep it there as a, refer a reference. If it's actionable, if the answer is yes, okay, so what's the next action? Can you do it in the next couple of minutes? Do you have time? If you do, do it. If you don't, make it as a project. Mark it, in, mark it in your calendar with actions. And so then there is the place for that to be done and it's not lost. So that's an example. In terms of organization, um, actionable stuff, need, need outlook or equivalent system, you put it in diaries, set reminders, identify actions. Uh, it's just finding ways to, um, uh, to, to, to organize that. And you can organize your environment in terms of folders, stickies, pens, trays, clear space, whatever it is that you need to be able to function. Um, you also need to be able to review things, weekly review, looking at the big picture, look at outstanding items, look for efficiencies, update your list, have you booked time to also think critically and creatively? Doing is very important. How do you choose to do something? Well, you need to think about the context. For example, uh, not everything needs to be uh, in front of a computer at a desk. Let's say you're waiting at the uh, bus station or um, you're traveling in a tram. You know, those kind of like quiet times those are great times for drafting ideas for a project, figuring out recruitment methods, planning your conference presentation, you know, or the outline of your manuscript, you know, just conceptually doing that. You don't always have to be in front of a computer and a screen to do certain things. Um, so in terms of, again, how to choose to do something, you look at the context, you look at the time that available that you have. Can this be done in five minutes before my next meeting? You know, do it. Also, energy available. Uh, when are you best? Are you in the morning in terms of creative creativity and mental focus, or late afternoon or at night? So, if you're early morning, uh, late. Uh, sorry, if if let's say um, if you're a, a, a morning. Uh, Professor Eric, I, I, I do uh, with all due respect. I do need to uh, put an end to the presentation because your time is up. I do have just one more slide and I'm finished, okay? Okay, we're gonna to to negotiate with Dr. Salas. <laughs> okay, just one more slide and then I'm done. Sure. Uh, so in my next slide, I just wanna say that um, uh, there's some activities there. Uh, once you uh, look at the, uh, the this presentation again, that you could do to help you with that organization and uh, decluttering the mind. Um, so I have activities three and four, and I would just like to conclude by saying that, you know, through this journey, what's very important is that persistence and consistency, uh, concentrated enthusiasm and devotion, and also doing whatever you have in front of you well. Thank you very much, and apologies for going uh, over by two minutes. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Erica. I, I... Totally, um, you know, totally resonate with every single milestone that you have taken us through in regards to how we should be uh, looking at the practical nature of our PhD journey. Some very interesting uh, nuggets, particularly initiative. I think it uh, reminds me of Rabindranath Tagore's saying that you can't cross the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. So thank you for sharing those um, insightful practical nuggets for us. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jim Salas from the University of California, San Diego. And he is also a professorial fellow at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. And as I understand today, he is joining us from Melbourne. So very good morning to you, Dr. Salas. 
Um, Dr. Salas co-leads uh, IPEN, which coordinates international studies with over 20 countries. Dr. Salas is a past president of Society of Behavioral Medicine and member of the National Academy of Medicine. He has authored 700 scientific publications and is one of the world's most cited authors. We are so honored to have you today, Dr. Salas. So with no further ado, Professor Salas, this time is now yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Siona. Um, I assume you can see my, uh, my screen. All right, we sure can, Doctor. Okay, all right, then I will, I will push ahead. Um, and I think my presentation might be somewhat complimentary uh, to Erica's because I'm um, focusing more on the journey after PhD, although uh, I think part of uh, most of what I say might be relevant to uh, PhD students as well. So, uh, okay. Okay, uh, so what are, what are the goals here? Um, uh, I want to uh, uh, think that we should first acknowledge burnout as a challenge that's worthy of attention. And what I'm telling you is um, my personal perspective. Uh, it's not based on any particular expertise uh, in uh, burnout, career burnout, except uh, my own journey. I'm trying to focus on simple principles and strategies um, uh, mainly because I, I don't know the literature on burnout, so uh, I don't know evidence-based strategies. Maybe that would have been a good thing for me to um, get familiar with over the years. Um, also, I don't know anyone who feels they have fully solved the problem of uh, uh, preventing burnout or work-life balance or um, uh, having a complete comfort level. Um, with, with their career. And I'll end with uh, how my priorities and attempted solutions have changed over the years and what, what I've learned over the years. So what this little cartoon means to me is that uh, is stress, uh, especially in a career, is inevitable, uh, but um, burnout is not. So we, we want to uh, stop before we fall off the cliff. All right. Um, research is hard, but uh, it is also rewarding. Um, uh, wherever you are in your career, you've, you've run across uh, experience of research being stressful. Um, it's really hard to get grants. Um, you, you get criticism constantly uh, about your ideas, your papers, your grants. Um, there are very many deadlines that we have to deal with. Uh, multitasking is required uh, and will, will not go away. And our gratification uh, is severely delayed. Um, uh, it takes years to uh, go from great idea to actually doing the study um, to getting a paper published. Uh, it, it's kind of ridiculous in some ways how, how long the gratification is delayed. Um, so if we're going to survive that um, inherent stress, uh, I think it's important to do two things. One is to enjoy the process. Um, and one of the things to enjoy is that uh, by doing this work, we get to be around smart and inspiring students, staff, and colleagues. Uh, this, is, this is something that um, you should not take for granted. We have opportunities for travel. Um, and that, uh, for those early in your career, that will happen more and more. And so that's something that uh, uh, many people don't get to, uh, don't get to enjoy. Um, research uh, is a creative process. And I, I think we need to emphasize that, that part of it more. Um, uh, that uh, certainly research, all, all research begins with ideas. So Creativity is, uh, is an uh, essential ingredient. Writing is a creative process. Mentoring is a creative process. So if you look at it from that point of view, it becomes more enjoyable. And then one of, one of the things that uh, Erica mentioned 
was in, in, enjoy the key moments. So savor each delayed reward when you get good news on a grant or when you get a paper accepted or when that paper comes out or when your student graduates. Uh, really make a point of uh, focusing and being mindful of those. Second, second strategy for me is to focus on the bigger picture. We can get lost in the, in the details of doing a study or how tedious it is to read, read so many papers and try to make sense of them. Um, but really, why are we doing all these things? Uh, to make people healthier and create a better world. So that should be very motivating. If, it, if that's not motivating, you're probably in the wrong profession. Uh, contributions to science are long lasting and world impacting. You may not see them in the short run, um, you may not ever know all the impact that your work has, um, but the, the, the papers you publish will be around in the journals and accessible for many years um, and will uh, hopefully continue to be used. So um, take some uh, pleasure in that. Uh, ISPNPA and also I, I, I know there's some ISPA um, members uh, on the call. Are, are making a difference in some of the world's most critical health challenges. So we are busy solving really big problems. So for me, this bigger picture has become a mission. You know, uh, um, it should be our mission to make people healthier and create a better world. So um, keep that in mind so you don't lose this this forest of, of big, uh, big uh, impacts um, in, the, in the, the trees of all the daily details you need to deal with. Okay, so what, what to do about preventing burnout or uh, reducing burnout? I, I call this basic hygiene, that we practice what we preach. It's as important for researchers um, to follow healthy habits as everyone else. And so none of this is, um, uh, is new, but, um, but I, I think we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that uh, being active and eating a healthful diet and getting enough sleep and not overdoing alcohol and including some stress management strategies um, is uh, as important for researchers as anyone else. So. Um, uh, that's, that's really, to me, a starting point to make sure you're taking good care of yourself. And I, I think this builds the resilience that, uh, that Erica mentioned as well. Um, okay, so probably this is the, one of the most difficult aspects is to um, have a life while you're having a career. And so that means you need to take actions to protect that time for, uh, for living. Um, be, uh, one of the things that I found is in your work life, almost nobody will tell you that you've accomplished enough for this week or this year. You've done enough. Uh, nobody will encourage you to slow down on papers or grants or reviews or service or meetings. Everybody wants you to do more. So um, uh, you've, got to, you've got to make your own decisions about that, of when to, uh, when to um, uh, say no to request. Um, but it's a given that research is not a 40 hour per week job. Um, I think uh, uh, that uh, you, you just have to adjust your expectations. And so you have to protect your own schedule. And um, uh, uh, just because it's not a 40 hour per week job does not mean it should uh, somehow um, morph into an 80 hour per week job. You need to set limits about when you log off and quit working each day. Um, I am not a proponent of uh, checking your, your emails one more time at 10 or 11 p.m. before you go to bed. I don't see any reason to do that. Um, so I, I think you need to shut off not only your computer, but your work mind um, each day and, uh, and, and focus on the rest of life. And you have to think about how much or how little do you want to work on the weekends. So those about 40 plus hours have to come from working longer days or working more, uh, more days. Um, but uh, it's very important to uh, set limits. And don't be a slave to email. 
Um, you, you, you are under no obligation. You don't have a contract to um, reply instantly or to keep up every hour. Um, so uh, uh, you have my permission at the very least to, to set limits on your email. Okay, um, enjoy your work, but also make time for enjoyment in the rest of your life. So there's a picture of, of somebody enjoying their work uh, along with their group, so that's great. So what do you enjoy about your work? Um, I think that's maybe a, 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 an assignment. Uh, that I can give you to think about what are you enjoying about your work? And if the answer is, mm, I don't know, or I'm not enjoying very much, then uh, that's a sign that you need to find ways to increase your enjoyment or to appreciate uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a more considered way uh, what your, your work uh, brings to you. Or if you can't find any enjoyment, uh, you might want to consider another career path. Um, and well, um, maybe as important, what do you enjoy outside of work? Um, hobbies or, <clears throat> or uh, you know, time with your family or uh, going for walks or cooking, whatever it is. And then how often do you do those things? Are you sacrificing most of the things that you enjoy for your work? Um, uh, if so, you need to make a goal to do those things regularly um, and don't, don't put them off until the holidays or don't put them off until next year. Um, you know, we need to be enjoying our lives uh, throughout our career. Um, if not every week, then uh, maybe every month or certainly every year. And so this uh, requires adjusting your time use. And also, don't feel guilty about enjoying yourself. Uh, uh, you, might, you might be out taking, uh, walking your dog and say, you know, I could be uh, reviewing that paper now, or I need to be working on a manuscript. Um, but no, you need that break. You, you need to have enjoyment. Don't deny yourself enjoyment, uh, but uh, enjoy uh, healthy things. Okay. Um, uh, one strategy that, you know, if you're going to be effective in reducing burnout, you're going to have to apply to some extent or another is doing what you love and reducing what you don't love. Um, as I said before, multitasking is a given. Think about all the, the things you're asked to do, research, teaching, mentoring, university service, professional service, hopefully at some point, research translation and community service. And there are many, of, of course, there's many, many elements in, in all of these. Um, and so you need to de de develop a strategy to reduce activities that you don't enjoy. And of course, this is particularly hard uh, for early uh, career academics, when it's hard for you to say no to um, uh, request to be on a committee or to teach another class or uh, to take on another student. And you may need mentoring from a senior colleague for this. And hopefully if you're, uh, uh, obviously if you're a doctoral student, you have uh, supervision, but um, if you're an early career person, um, you really should have a senior colleague who uh, can act as a mentor for you. Um, but at whatever uh, stage of your career, it's easier to ask for fewer committees or less teaching if you excel in other areas, um, such as your research, or if you say, oh, I've taken on extra teaching and I'm, I'm doing well in that and getting good reviews, so that means I, I can't be on another committee. So um, um, uh, being excellent in at least one area, if not more, uh, can help you uh, adjust the demands on your time for other areas. So many of, uh, many of you are integrating research with community service and mentoring, you know, so mentoring such as getting students involved in your research. So that helps you tick multiple boxes. Um, so you're doing uh, uh, service, but it's part of your research. So uh, I think there's some efficiency in that. Um, okay, here's another strategy, um, is over time cultivating a cohesive and supportive team, um, uh, especially for your research. 
everything these days requires teamwork. So leading and collaborating with teams uh, is a basic skill. It also relieves pressure that you have to do everything or be an expert in everything. So uh, I suggest that early on you, you uh, become intentional about developing a good team or collaborating with, a, uh, with an excellent team. And team members uh, can be students, they can be staff, um, they can be colleagues, and those colleagues can be at your university or elsewhere. Um, uh, so you don't, you don't need to just narrowly look and say uh, to find your team members. And over time, using your grants to build a stable staff can be highly rewarding and time-saving. Um, and so the team becomes your support system. They become your friends. They, um, uh, and uh, 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 really make uh, you able to focus on the things that you're best at or that your time is best used for. And as a team leader, if you really want to create a cohesive and supportive team, you need to focus on building their skills, encouraging them to lead components of studies and give them credit for team successes. So part of your work as a team leader is to mentor and uh, build them. And that, that creates uh, a, a sense of loyalty and commitment to you and uh, the team as a whole. Okay, um, I'm getting near the end now. So uh, we should have uh, plenty of time for discussion. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's important uh, to take a break uh, every so often, to tune out of work, to drop out of meetings and uh, electronic communications to unplug. And all of this helps you as a person recharge. So I'm showing you pictures here um, of how I spent most of my last week, um, which was uh, uh, getting out into the bush um, in Tasmania. Um, and so uh, I'm a firm believer that vacations, including micro vacations, which can be a day or a weekend or even a half a day, um, may be essential for mental health and preventing or recovering from burnout. And I mean real vacations where you don't check your email while you're out um, on a hike. So um, I'm so, and, and uh, I suggest you get used to unplugging for a few hours, a few days, or a couple of weeks. Um, in, in my experience, uh, a, a real break from work can recharge your passion uh, to do important work um, and use different parts of your brain and uh, recognize that you are a whole person, not only just a a researcher and a worker or a student. And I would say, don't wait until it's too late to do any good. Um, uh, even if you're a graduate student and you feel like you're under a lot of pressure, you have time, time uh, deadlines, um, still you need to take those breaks on the weekend or even just go out, go into a park um, uh, uh, in the afternoon or on a lunch break and um, uh, uh, tune out, drop out, and unplug so that you can recharge. Uh, so what have I learned over the years? Uh, one is that you have to take care of yourself. <coughs> you, you might have, you, you might, you, hopefully you have a partner um, who will um, remind you that you need to take care of yourself and spend the time for the rest of your life. Um, uh, uh, Sometimes if a, if a colleague or supervisor says, you know, you really need to take a break, that might be an indication that your break is overdue and that you were showing signs of burnout or, or fatigue. So you need to keep, uh, you know, keep track of your, uh, uh, to, and know your needs uh, of your mind and body and take steps to, uh, to meet those needs. But it's something you're mainly gonna have to do yourself. 
certainly one thing I learned is that you have to say no more often as time goes on because people will ask you to do more and more. Um, so uh, whereas early in your career, you might have to say no every uh, uh, few, few uh, uh, weeks or months, um, later on, you have to get used to saying no uh, every week or every day, but it, it's something that you can do. You have to set your own priorities. What's gonna be better for me? What's the better use of my time? Which choice helps me meet my career, life, or enjoyment goals? We all want to please people. We all are in roles of service, um, but uh, all, that is in jeopardy if you don't take care of yourself. Spending time with family is not uh, just a cliche or an excuse for uh, you know, uh, stepping out of the political world. It's really the heart of life. And, um, uh, and it, it's, uh, it, you know, I think for throughout your career, uh, you want to uh, make sure that you're not making your family second class citizens. So don't wait until you have achieved all your career goals before prioritizing quality of life. It's something that you need to uh, do throughout your career. And if I was to sum up my, my approach to uh, preventing burnout, it's that your career is important, but your quality of life is more important. So if you need to take a vacation and it means that you have to skip submitting a grant or you have to delay uh, getting a paper out, then uh, that's, that's probably worth doing. So that's all from me. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to you, Siona. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salas. I think that was very insightful in terms of uh, making us a little bit aware of what are the realities of running a day being a PhD student, uh, particularly the, uh, the phrase that you use that your career is more important, but um, your career is important, but your quality of life is more important. Um, I guess it, it comes down to what Jim Rohn used to say, uh, either you run the day or the day runs you, which I guess in a PhD student's life can be quite the reality. So we will open uh, the, uh, the screen now for some discussions and this time that we have left. Um, our first question actually comes from Stephanie Stockwell and she's addressed this to all the panelists and attendees. I'm wondering if Erica can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. So um, she says, uh, currently all advice has been very pressured. Go to all seminars, go to extra events, help, our, uh, help other people, go in on the weekend. So this to us is what we fight with every day and just makes us feel like we are inadequate and should be doing all these things leading to burnout. So what can we do to avoid this? Yes, uh, first, first of all, I think it's important to understand that the supervisors, it's their responsibility to make the students aware that there are workshops, there are events, you know, for them to, um, uh, to, to be present at. So it's their responsibility to make the student aware. It doesn't mean that uh, the students should uh, go to all the workshops, to all the presentations, to all the events that are happening within the school department or university. Um, and, and it's about, again, going through those seven principles again, and I can see um, uh, several, several of them apply to this particular situation. First of all, it's about kind of stepping back, not panicking in, and kind of taking control, right? So going back to the why, why am I doing this? What is my focus? Um, if, let's say, I'm asked to go into the, uh, for, for, for the, uh, or into the university on the weekend for this particular workshop, which is free, that, you know, uh, I could or not take. Um, if, let's say, you have already organized events with your family and your family is a priority, uh, then the answer is clear. And it's not about feeling guilty, but it's about taking control of your week, of your day, of your life. Um, interdependence, that comes in. Let's say... There is a very important workshop, but you've committed to a family time. Share it with other students. Say to uh, your peers, why don't you go to these three and then I'll go to these three. 
Um, also, communication with your supervisor. If you communicate to your supervisor that, hey, you're asking me to do all these things, but there's only so much time in my day, can we please identify what do you think is the most important thing for me to attend? So it's about not, lose, not panicking and, 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 uh, and taking control back. Uh, and, 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 um, and, and the reality is going through those principles will help you know, with that decision making. It's about taking yes. control back. And I really like what um, uh, Professor Jim Sa Salis has said around that, also taking that uh, break, that unplugging, you know, reducing that panic and anxiety. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Um, Dr. Salis, would you like to comment on that as well? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, this um, the, the comment about, well, this you're giving us a lot of advice. That's a lot of things to do. And I guess I would say that, um, these, this is a, um, a, a menu of, of strategies. And I don't think it means you need to do all of them all the time. Um, it, I think these are uh, ideas and strategies um, that uh, some of them might help you at some times and some of them you might need at other times. Um, so that, that's the way I would look at it, not to feel pressured. Oh, I, have, I, I can't do all of these things. I can't think of all of this all at once, um, that's okay. But uh, um, I, I see there's been some uh, requests to, oh, it'd be nice to have the slides. And I think that would be helpful as a reminder, you know, if you're feeling, uh, okay, I'm kind of under a lot of stress, I, 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 I need some ideas about how to manage things, then you can go back and, uh, and then something, something may resonate that didn't, that didn't strike you before. Thank you. Um, I, I, both of you have mentioned at some point in your in your talk that uh, the role of the supervisor uh, indirectly or directly plays um, some sort of a, a role in burnout. So um, I guess on that note, uh, should um, supervisors be monitoring burnout of their students? Would you like to comment on that? Either um, either or both, Jim and um, Dr. Um, Eric. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think, I mean, as supervisors, uh, we do care about our health and well-being of our students and their mental health. So definitely uh, doing supervisory uh, meetings, that should be an item on the agenda. So it should be an agenda item um, to discuss uh, how the student is feeling, or uh, is that what you're trying to say, Dr. Uh, Erica? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that there will always needs to be kind of check in. How is it going? You know, how are you handling this load, this workload? You know, do you need any other support? Uh, what can I do to help you? Or you know, the uh, your uh, the other student, the peer students, or the second supervisor, whatever it is. What other support do you need? Is there something happening personally that you know you would need some time off? You know. All those things need to be discussed, I think, at every supervisory meeting. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would generally uh, agree with that. Um, um, you know, with uh, my students, I would um, uh, tend to uh, uh, set goals for, you know, the next couple of weeks and, and I say, okay, uh, you know, on this project or this paper or whatever, what, what's realistic for you to do? And what other, what other things are you, you know, uh, going to be struggling with um, in this time? Um, and uh, so try to make real, help them make realistic goals and not to put uh, too much stress. Or if it, uh, if it seems like they're they're having uh, difficulty managing all the demands being placed on them. You know, well, let's talk about that. And is it an issue with managing your time effectively or is it an issue of um, there's just too much uh, on your plate to do and we need to um, uh, uh, push back some, some deadlines for later uh, that can be moved. So try to be sensitive to the, uh, to the student's situation. Um, and uh, and be uh, uh, open to them saying, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm just overwhelmed or I, I have this family issue that I need to deal with and, um, and uh, 
help them help them manage that so that um, you become an assistant and not not just somebody who's giving them more work all the time, um, but uh, a person who's helping them uh, learn how to manage uh, all the demands of work and life. Thank you, um, Dr. Salas. We do have a question from Shane uh, Nugent, who says, do you have advice for not feeling guilty about taking time off? Whilst I'm taking time off, I can really, I can't really switch off from what I'm doing other things with. I need to do research wise, leading inefficient time, defeating the object and almost creating more stress due to the need to catch up. So I guess he's, what uh, Shame's trying to say is, how do we actually stop feeling guilty for taking time off? Well, you um, have to make it, oh, sorry, sorry. Go no, on. You go. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, we have to make a decision and, 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 and stop feeling guilty. <laughs> how do you do that? The, the reality is, if you need time off, if your body, your mental health, if you do mentally, physically, you need time off, you need to take the time off. So then you can be more effective and more efficient and more creative. So you need that time off. So that's a way to rationalize it. I need to take this time, I need to unplug, I need to step back. So then when I come back, I'm fully charged, fully energized, and you know, to do what I need to do. If you kind of do it half and half, it's not gonna work. You either unplug, and take the time for rest and relaxation or don't. You know, you have to completely unplug, take the time, get away. Maybe if you're still around uh, too close to work to a computer, um, maybe that's what the problem is. Maybe you need to go on a hike or a walk somewhere away so you can truly unplug and um, have that break. Thank you, Erica. Um, our next question um, is... Uh, uh, sorry, Siona, perhaps uh, Professor Salis might want to also contribute? Um, uh, maybe just a, a couple of ideas. One is, um, yes, I, I think uh, this kind of reframing, as, um, as Erica was just talking about, uh, is important and um, look at it not as shirking work or you know, wasting time, but, uh, uh, but um, uh, taking break is a way to, for you to work more efficiently and probably work more enjoyably. Um, so you don't feel like you're, mm, uh, you know, uh, you're, if you're just working all the time, so at some point you're gonna, um, uh, you know, rebel against that. You're you're going to um, be unhappy that you're working all the time and not not doing other things. So uh, I, I think you know you have to reframe taking a break as being a smart worker and being more efficient. And the other thing I would say is maybe uh, you get better at it with practice. Um, and if you if you get more regular about taking breaks and you know, you can look at it as a reward for a, a productive week um, that I get to take a break. I get to do something I really enjoy um, and make it make it more a, uh, a more common or routine activity that uh, I think you can um, you can learn to um, be more effective at having a more balanced life. Thank you. I think it's an interesting question here that we have is how do you differentiate between stress and burnout in, uh, while doing a PhD journey? Yeah. I think either of you could take that one. I think stress is, can you hear me? Cause I, I was uh, dropped up, yeah. Uh, stress, uh, st burnout, I guess it's the, <laughs> it's the outcome of stress. You know, that you are stressing, 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 you're not addressing the stress that would lead to a burnout. That's the outcome. Yeah, that's the that's that's the bad outcome. And uh, and that's the sense that you're you're overwhelmed or you feel like I can't take it anymore. Um, uh, and stress, stress is normal. Uh, you have to um, you know, we all have to find ways of dealing, dealing with stress. So you never get rid of stress. But when stress gets to the, the breaking point, 
then um, then uh, uh, then you know I think we're in trouble. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen again uh, if I can because uh, uh, I want to go back to my uh, title slide. Uh, I, I put this head on fire as a symbol of burnout. Uh, you know, you, <laughs> when you feel like, oh, I just can't take it anymore. I think that's burnout and it's a symptom that you've not been taking care of yourself and that you need to do something differently. So um, I, and that's why I said it, it with basic hygiene, you know, kind of doing some kind of stress management along the way um, is a uh, is a really smart move, so you you don't get to that point. Uh, but I think it's a matter of taking care of yourself um, and um, uh, uh, you know managing your time and your responsibilities so that you don't get overwhelmed. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Salas. I think we are running out of time at the moment, so I'm going to try and. Um share my screen to really wind this okay, up. Okay, I'm gonna stop share. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so just uh, before we finish up, this is a reminder that uh, the Isbun Park 2019 annual meet is happening in Prague next year from the 4th of 7th of, uh, to the 7th of June. Uh, I think it's an exciting opportunity because we have an eight hour workshop for early career researchers and students on the 4th of June. And the workshop is going to address um, those who are interested in career development topics outside of academia. So we're gonna cover government health policy, non-government organizations, uh, journalism. The workshop will also address building a strong CV, developing leadership skills, peer reviewing articles, networking, advocacy, and communication to policymakers to translate research to practice. So it's a fantastic workshop, a great opportunity for you to uh, interact uh, with uh, experts in the field. There'll be Q&A sessions as well as roundtable discussions. So that's happening on the 4th of June, uh, 2019 at the Isbun Park Prague next year. Um, before we sign out, uh, just a little reminder that today's presentation is being recorded. I know we've gone a little bit over the hour, but it is there for you as a link uh, online for your future reference. Um, a big thank you to our presenters, uh, Professor Salas and Professor Erica, for sharing your time and some useful insights and nuggets, I'm sure, with your slides. A lot of the people will be viewing that in the future. Thank you for your time. Uh, a big thanks to our audience for your, um, your participation and your questions. Um, the PhD journey has been a new one for me and I certainly can, uh, can identify with what the participants are trying to say in terms of burnout. And here's a phrase that uh, I always use to motivate me. It's uh, I think by Robert Schuller and he says, it's not how low you drop down, it's how high we bounce up that counts. So it's a good morning from Melbourne, from all of us here. Thank you very much and goodbye.